and welcome back to another episode of the Real Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jake O'Connor. Real Conversations podcast for those dedicated to doing hard things and living a meaningful life. This belief is perhaps best encapsulated by a quote from the great Teddy Roosevelt. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, nor the doer of deeds could have done them better. Now the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena. With that being said, welcome back to another episode of Real Conversations. And today I'm joined by Jason Illion. Jason, how are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I'm excited. <laughs> I am surprised. We were talking before we started. I'm from St. Louis. I didn't know Wichita very well when I came here. And I'm surprised of the people that I continue to find in Wichita where it's like, whoa, what an incredible story. And I have no, I, no idea they were just like hidden here in Wichita yeah. in plain sight. And, there's, a, uh, there's a lot of them, actually. You know, I'm from Dallas. And so coming up here in Wichita, I found the same thing, that there's a number of just brilliant men and women um, that not only are great in in business, but also just great life lessons as well. And they just live in, you know, Wichita is still kind of a little quiet, sleepy town yeah. in general. Um, but hidden beneath the surface, there's a lot of wisdom there. Yeah. It's kind of that traditional Midwest, like everyone minds their own business. No one really digs too deep and they're not going to go ask and try and pry information. So when you do find a gym, it's like, whoa, I yeah. didn't even know you were there. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, at a high level, obviously I, I did my background research, play football at TCU. You went to the London School of Economics. Uh, became a founder, exited. Now you now you've got your own co-founder, your own VC firm. I would love to dive a little bit more into that and get some context. I mean, how do all of those events transpire? Yeah, well, so I guess we've got to start back, and and you know when you look back in life, right? It's you can kind of see God's fingerprints all over your life, but it's never uh, a straight line, right? Even like when you put a business plan together for your company, it, it's always go about every business plan I ever see goes up and to the right, right? That's how the graph works. <laughs> That's not how life works, yeah. right? And the one common thread throughout my life honestly, are just really great people um, that have poured into me and I've tried to add value. And so when you look at all these different things and tried to overcome hard things, kind of even the beginning of my career, I wasn't given a scholarship at TCU. I walked on, I walked on, I came on academic and I earned a football scholarship. Basically they told me out of high school, you're too white, you're too <laughs> slow, you're not strong enough to play this game. And my answer was just watch me, right? Like I really wanted to do this. And I saw so many other you know, naturally phenomenal athletes to do this. I thought maybe I wasn't given all those gifts from day one, but I think I can develop them. Mm -hmm. And I, then I just got part of a great program at TCU and coaching staffs that helped me develop. And by the time I left, I was like team captain, right. And helped, you know, help grow that team. And so that's kind of very similar to every step of life. Of like, if you're really committed to something and you connect with other great people that it can coach and mentor and help you, and every, all those steps kind of are connected because somebody poured into me or I did a random outreach to help somebody and then boom, boom, boom. It just, it kind of, you know, life took it from there. To perform at a high level, I feel like there's a layer of confidence that has to be built. Did you find that in football or where is that kind of built for you? Yeah. You know, I think my parents did a pretty good job in life. First of all, we didn't come from a wealthy family. Both my parents were educators so they started from day one just to say, like, you're not going to be given anything. <laughs> like, we live in a society now there's a lot of entitlement. That mm -hmm. People think they they deserve something. My parents took the separate approach and said, like, forget that. You're, you're not giving anything. Like, when I left for college, everything I owned fit in my car, right? And when I left college, everything that I owned fit in my car. Like, I just didn't have anything. And so I just really believe that the American spirit, right, is really you get to create your own future, and to do that, you have to actually work really hard to do that. And so each step of the way, my parents poured into me and then my co kind of coaches in college, you know, when you're not the scholarship kid, you don't get the same thing all the scholarship guys get from day one, right? And so you have to earn that. And so every step was just earning the right to be in the room, right? And working harder and adding value and, you know, caring about people. And if you do those things long enough and well enough, doors start to open for you. And I think that started when I was a kid. It certainly continued to be, um, you know, developed kind of through my faith walk and the church and the ministry stuff that we had. And then as you have small successes along the way, it starts to solidify that for you. Like, hey, I can really do that. Um, and, you know, sometimes that happens in sports. Sometimes it happens in work. And hopefully it just happens with the good people around you as well. So you go to you go to college and you play football. How do you end up with this incredible finance background, London School of Economics, and just very well versed in this space? Yeah. So um, I was wanted to play college football and then hopefully play pro one day. And 
I ended up getting hurt quite a bit in college, right? And we could just talk about my medical records for the next hour, but <laughs> that's not what everybody wants to hear. But um, as I was going through this, one of the guys in college challenged me. He goes, well, you know, you could always play for a pro team where you can own the team. Which one would you rather do? And I was thinking, that's interesting. Oh, that's awesome. Interesting framework, right? And so I started really doubling down on on the business side and really learning how to do that and just kind of see how life works. One of my English teachers in college submitted an application for me my junior year and put me up for this USA Today scholarship, right, and award. And every year the USA Today used to choose the top 20 students in America. And that's what happened. My senior year, I was chosen one of the top 20 students in America. And they look at academics and athletics and community service and all sorts of these different pieces. But I was cho- I was chosen from that. So I got done playing in the bowl game against USC, which we were 17-point underdogs and ended up winning. And then I went to the Lennon School of Economics because TCU had a joint program, and I studied there for six months. And then I won this award. And when it came out in the paper, you got to remember, this is late 90s. I'm an old guy. Right? <laughs> late 90s, people weren't all on the internet all the time, so the paper really mattered. And um, Dick Strong, who ran, he ran Strong Capital Management in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, called me in London and said, don't take a job until I can talk to you. And so when I got back from London, he flew me to Milwaukee and said, I will let you train in all different areas of finance if you come work for our firm. So that's what I did. And, you know, it was because an English teacher believed in me enough to submit an application for me that I I didn't even know she submitted. I won an award that I didn't know what it was about. And then it kind of took me to my first job. How surreal is that experience to be one of 20 and then to get that call from a firm like that? You know, it was, uh, it's humbling. You know, I sat in that room with 19 other kids and, you know, Shaka Smart, who was a college basketball coach, was, was there and a number of other kids. And, you know, one of the kids was working on a cure for AIDS. One of them spoke like 10 languages. And I'm like, what am I doing? (laughs) I'm like, I snuck in or somehow. Um, It was humbling. And, you know, it was also a great experience to get around some, um, I would say, very intentional, purposeful um, young people that had a plan for their lives, right? And were really working hard. And so, when you when you're around greatness, you kind of rise to that greatness. Right? Some people don't, but a lot of people, if they're around that, they kind of naturally gravitate. They want to be part of that, and I think that was just a good opportunity for me to be around. Hey, 19 other amazing students from all over the country, and they were excelling in medicine, and business, and language, and politics, and they let me be part of the group. And as being part of that group, kind of helped me accelerate as well. That's incredible. So. Did you go then and work for uh, that firm or did you jump straight to the entrepreneur side? So I went to uh, Strong Capital Management. I spent uh, about three plus years there. And while I was doing that, a lot of my friends were wave one entrepreneurs. So they were starting firms like Napster and Friendster <laughs> and all the stirs, right? Like yeah. all the first wave tech companies. And at the time, nobody knew really what was happening. This was like the beginning of the real internet because before this, so late nineties, the internet was just a place you went to look at information. Then all of a sudden it started to go from flat to interactive and the internet we know today where you have social profiles and you can buy products and you can chat, like none of that existed. It's hard to believe that wasn't that long ago. Mm. But when I started seeing that happening at that time, Um, And a lot of my friends in Silicon Valley and other parts of the country were excelling in that. I was like, just fascinated. And so that's when I left kind of that part of my corporate life at that time to move back to Dallas and start the entrepreneur life because I thought there's something going on here with this internet thing. I want to be part of it. I don't even know what part I want to be part of yet. I just think it's something special. Was that the dot-com boom you're talking about? Yeah, it was, it was the kind of the original dot-com boom when everybody was diving in. And, you know, it got out over its skis, right? I mean, web van, they were trying to deliver stuff, and that didn't work until just a few years ago, right? Right. Um, but it was the first wave of, hey, technology could really transform our lives. And I'm not sure I fully grasped it completely, but I knew something special was happening. So where do you go from there? You realize that there's like this trend going on that these web companies are starting to pop up and they're having success. How do you actually turn that into a company or find one to join? Yeah, so I I moved back to Dallas. One of my friends was starting a company at the time called Handango. And Handango was the first app store except for Nokia phones. So before the Apple app store, they were trying to do this on Nokia phones, right? And Nokia at the time, they were the juggernaut. Like they were the Apple of the world, right? They were the Facebook 
And he built the first company that was doing apps on your Nokia phone. And I remember the first time looking at like, I could pull up my email and a spreadsheet on my phone. I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> like, wow, this is the future. Look at the possibilities. Um, and so when he was doing that, I was starting back in Dallas, helping him on some things. I got involved with a, a gentleman who wanted to start a video site, a Christian video site called GodTube. And uh, at first I said, he asked if I want to be involved and I said, no. Um, and then he said, Hey, you know, I really could use some help. And a couple of my friends helped fund the first one. And so I got involved and, um, that kind of started my progress of building, you know, websites and uh, building software companies. And, um, you know, GodTube at first was, this was early in the YouTube days, right? So there was YouTube and GodTube and we were just the video site for Christian videos. And, um, we grew from 20,000 users to like 2 million in like 30 days. Jeez. And we're the fastest growing website in the world for like a couple months. <laughs> and I'd love to tell you it was because we were brilliant, but we just did a couple small things well, because this was before social profiles. And so we just connected to that address book where you could just share it with all your friends. Right. And it just went viral. That is crazy. So what, what was your role within that company? So I just started as an advisor then became the um, kind of chief strategy officer and then later became the CEO. That is incredible. And, um, you know, it's funny because I didn't even want to do it at first <laughs> and, then get, and made it all the way to CEO. But it was part of that walk of where that process too of learning how to drive a company and learning how to take multiple funding rounds and learning how to run software engineers onshore and offshore and um, learning the early stages of the internet of what we could and could do. And we were limited back then too. Like people think today, like when we start a new company, we can just spin up servers on AWS or Azure or anything else. Back then we had to host our own metal, right? Like it was, everything was hard and um, it's become so much easier. I mean, you can spin up a whole company now for thousands of dollars, tens of thousands. From which, your bedroom with, yeah. one, with one computer. Yeah. I mean, look what we're doing, even podcasting. You right. couldn't do this even 10 years ago. And so the technology has come so far along that it's kind of become ubiquitous. But back then it took millions of dollars just to get these things off the ground because it took so much physical person ability to, to, to launch these sites and these companies. And so that was my first, that was kind of my first foray into like learning how to lead and learning how to build software companies. Was GodTube acquired? It was. It was acquired by Salem Communications. Okay. Um, which is one of the larger Christian websites in the, in the world. Um, and that was a, that was a huge, interesting ride. I mean, what I always tell people and they're like, was that a huge success? The answer was, it, you know, in the scheme of hitting a home run to like a single and double, it was like a single, Right. And because we got caught up in the 2008 financial crisis, right? Jeez. And this was when everybody was cutting huge amounts of their staff and we had to do the same thing. And um, it was, for me, it was a huge learning curve of like, hey, you can have your investors pushing you to spend lots of money. And they were, they were like, spend, 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 spend. <laughs> and I remember being in board meetings saying like, why are we spending so fast? Like we need to slow down. But everybody was like, we'll just give you more money. <laughs> that's, that's great until they don't. Right. Like until it actually hits yeah. the fan. And that's what happened is, you know, one of our key investors who kept telling us to spend showed up one day and said, yeah, we're not giving you any more money after they just told us to spend everything we had. Right. And so I think that's where I, I learned that you have to be very um, discerning and judicious as the leader that you can't get caught up in FOMO and what everybody else is doing. You have to be really thoughtful about how does this business generate capital? How does it grow? How does it add value? And if you can do those things well and long enough, then you can potentially, you know, build something that truly is a home run. So you hit a single, you've got those learning lessons and you got your, your beak a little bit wet. Maybe your interest has peaked. Where do you go from there? Yeah. So we did that. We sold the company. Um, then we started another company called Bookshout and Bookshout was kind of a B2B ebook company, but it, that wasn't the original vision. The original vision was at the time, uh, was a social reading platform saying the same way that you have social, you know, social profiles. What if we shared a book and some of it just came down to like, Hey, if we're studying in class together, can I see your notes? Can you see mine? Or, Hey, if we're reading the same, you know, Elon Musk book, can I see your notes? And, or how cool would it be to see Bill Gates's notes on Elon Musk's book? Right. Right. So that's how we launched. We got it going. We really couldn't make it work. Like people didn't want to like share each other's notes. <laughs> 
And we're like, why? They want to share on everything else. Why not this? But as we were learning this, what we found is that people, um, big companies wanted to buy 10,000 or 20,000 or 100,000 ebooks at a time. And there was no mechanism for that. Well, we built all the infrastructure to do that. So we shifted and said, hey, we can provide, you know, Nike 50,000 ebooks at one time if they want to buy it. And it actually came up because one company called us and said, hey, can you provide a thousand ebooks for us? And we want to distribute them with codes to our people. And I was like, yeah, sure, we can do that. And then I went back to my developers. I'm like, can we do that? <laughs> and so, I mean, that's entrepreneurship, right? It is best as like you say yes, and then you figure it out. And, you know, all the kudos to the team that they did. Like we figured out how to do that. And so we built this company, which was kind of the B2B Kindle of the time, um, which later went on and sold to a private equity group in, in 2017. That's not just entrepreneurship. That's a good entrepreneur because you listen to your customers. Like the amount of people that I see day to day are just that everyone's seen or heard of that are focused on one direction. Their customers are asking for one thing and they're just not listening. Yeah. Well, it sounds good in your head. I mean, there, when I see business plans, and I'm glad you brought that up, um, because now I'm on the investor side. I see business plans all the time and people are like, this is a real problem. And my answer it could be is often like, yeah, well, maybe. Mm -hmm. and, and that sounds good in your head and it even may sound good to me, but what does the customer say? Because there's a lot of things that I think should be fixed, but people don't buy yeah. or they don't value. And so you really do have to hear what your customer has to say. And honestly, um, I wish I would have learned that even earlier in life to say, hey, I've got an idea, just go test it. Don't spend a whole lot of time. Don't spend a whole lot of money. Just, you know, get out there, test the market and see what it tells you and then build what it is and iterate so that you can get it to where somebody wants to spend a lot of money with you. And it's not just test the market. It's have a good group of advisors that are going to be honest with you. We have to read, we had to read a book last year for my capstone class before I graduated called the mom test. And it's this idea that, you know, your friends and your parents, especially your mom, any idea you bring to her, she's going to be like, oh, that's the greatest idea ever, honey. You should go do it. Everyone's going to love it. But you need people like that are going to be brutally honest with you. And I don't think someone's really your friend or a true advisor. if They're not willing to share that truth with you. Yeah, I, I think you hit the nail right on the head that you need advisors that are not, um, they like you, but they're not enthralled with you, right? They respect you, but they're not afraid to tell you you're full of crap, <laughs> right? And you need to marry somebody like that too, right? Mm -hmm. And you need to talk to your kids like that. Like they need to know if they're doing well, like encourage them, but also remind them they're not Michael Jordan yet. Like if you <laughs> want to be Michael Jordan, you got a lot of work to do, right? right? And so you want those people in your life that, are not afraid to tell you the truth and you got to keep them around you. And what I've found is that, um, a people like level a people, they want those people around them. B people don't B performers. They want C and D people around them, right? Because they don't want to know the truth because then they have to act on it. Right. And so people that are kind of B players, they're not good leaders. Um, that doesn't mean they don't add value. It's just that real leaders have to take hard truths take it to heart and make adjustments. And yeah. that's not, that's not easy. I was just about to say that. I don't want to say it like that's easy, you know, just have people that tell you the truth. Like the truth really hurts sometimes. Like it, you can really question your identity and who you are and what you're trying to do when someone that you trust says something contrary to what you may believe. Yeah. You know, we, um, we take our family every, every summer to a Christian family camp. And, um, one of my sons was getting ready to try to go ski and he'd never skied before. And uh, he's on the back of the boat and the counselor's sitting there and he could see that uh, my son and I aren't agreeing on how to get going. Right? <laughs> so he kind of just says, hey, dad, why don't you sit down for a second? And so I sit down, he walks over to my son and he goes, hey, uh, Rain, you're made to do hard things. And I just kind of stepped back and I was like, man, that man just dropped the truth bomb <laughs> on my son. And I saw my son shake his head and he's like, you're made to do hard things. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to get out there and we're going to we're going to pull you multiple times. You're going to get up. We're not getting out until you get up. And I just watched him walk my son through this. Um, and I think, and actually we have this saying at our wall, on our wall at a house, it says you're made to do hard things. That's awesome. Because it's only through the hard things that the greatness really becomes, right? And you don't get stronger unless you put more weight on that bar than you think you can to start pushing it, right? Um, you can run further than you think you can, right? You can work harder than you think you can. And so, um, putting yourself in those situations and surrounding yourself with people that will push you, you just have no idea how much better you can be. I 
I love that. That's like my thesis for life. <laughs> so yeah, good. It's awesome. So you get acquired by private equity. What's next? Yeah. So we get acquired. We're in Dallas, you know, I'm newly married with a couple kids and, uh, we just built a home in Dallas and my wife and I were like, Hey, let's take a little bit of time off. And, um, we, my wife and I had spent quite a bit of time spending in ministry and, uh, philanthropy and we're helping and thought, Hey, we'll, we'll just either build another business or do this again in Dallas. And, um, one of my friends was living in Wichita, Kansas, and he worked for a, a small place called Coke industries. Real and, small. Yeah. Real small. And he's like, Hey, um, I know you do a lot of stuff in tech. Would you come up here and talk to some of our execs about what you do? And I was like, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll be up there in a couple of months. My wife, Alicia's from Wichita. Mm. And so I'm like, I'll be up there to see family. I'll come see you. Um, so we did that. And a 30 minute conversation turned into like three hours. And he said, Hey, that's great. We come back and do it again. And you know, for your buddies, of course, happy to help one thing led to another. And next thing I know, um, find out that Coke wants to build a growth and venture unit and ask if I want to come up and help. Um, and so, you know, that new house we just built, <laughs> we just put, we put on the market and Jeez. we, we moved to, to Wichita, Kansas. And, um, you know, I guess the rest is history. There's nowhere more attractive than Wichita, Kansas. Yeah. Yeah. No, listen, I, I was in Dallas and I love Dallas. And when I moved to Wichita, I remember thinking, my wife, my wife's from Wichita. So she'd asked many times, would you ever think about moving to Wichita? And being an entrepreneur and technologist, I'm like, I always said, what am I going to do in Wichita? Like not that a lot of tech companies running around here. Um, but this door opened, right? And since I've been here and you and I talked about this before we got on air is I've been just amazed and shocked at the number of amazing entrepreneurs and executives in Wichita, Kansas. It's incredible. And the number of people that are either from here or have spent time here. So Steve Case, who founded AOL, he spent time in Wichita, Kansas, right? Like the guys that run Cargill lived in Wichita, Kansas. I can go down this list of like 15 or 20 people that I know that are either from Wichita or lived here. And, you know, I never thought of this like the, I knew it was geographically the center of the U.S. I didn't know it was like the starting point or jumping off point for so many great businesses, but it really is. And I think part of it is just people in Wichita are just hardworking, down-to-earth people. Yeah. And because of that, they've been able to either start great businesses, be part of great businesses, or launch great businesses. And so my family's loved it here. As we were talking about how I ended up in Wichita, I mentioned to you, I didn't even know Wichita, Kansas was a real place. Like They had that Final Four run, and I heard of them maybe once then. But then um, I received my Jabera scholarship for entrepreneurship here. And whenever I was talking to the faculty, I was like, look, I don't even know what Wichita is about. I don't know where it is, what you guys do. And they, one of the things they shared with me is that Wichita State University has the oldest entrepreneurship program in the country. Really? In the entire U.S. I did not know and that. And so, like, we have this deep, rich history of entrepreneurship that many people still don't know about to this day. Right, right. And the entrepreneurs that build businesses here, they build real businesses, right? Like, they thought from day one, like, how does this generate capital and add value and touch people's lives. And so it is a great place if you want to come learn um, because people are willing to share. Yeah. Back to Coke Industries. If you don't know, a lot of my listeners, again, are back from St. Louis where, where I grew up. Uh, they're, they flip flop back and forth between like number one, number two, maybe number three of the pr largest private companies in the U.S. And so they just have this giant balance sheet. So what is it like for you to go to this giant company and, and help lead up this new investment arm? Yeah. So, you know, it was certainly um, another humbling experience, right? Because you come in here from day one and you sit down with Charles Koch and his son and, and figure out how are you going to invest potentially billions of dollars? <laughs> and and that's what we did, right? They that The original vision was super broad, which doesn't surprise me because <laughs> Koch and Charles is a genius. And so he basically said, I want to do best investments at any stage and any time. And I was like, oh man, we're screwed. <laughs> like, how am I going to do that? Um, but fortunately with Chase and myself and a few others that we hired, we built out a team that, you know, put about, I guess, $3 billion to work during my time, um, built a team of 20 or so investment professionals. And we were able to build an incredible network. And where I spent quite a bit of my time was at building our network. So spending time with other venture capitalists and entrepreneurs and um, family offices and just other groups to um, really triangulate what, like, who are the best entrepreneurs? What are the best ideas? How are they growing? How can we add value to that? And, you know, I also learned a lot from um, Charles because he had kind of the MBM or Marcus-based management and it was his framework for doing 
you know, building businesses. And so when a, when somebody like that takes, picks up a business at 20 million and grows it to 150 billion, you may want to listen, right? He may have something that you can learn from. And there was lots of great frameworks, um, and, and models that he used to kind of think about the growth of Coke industries. And we tried to employ as many of those we could in, uh, KDT, which was our growth and venture unit there. And so it was a, it was a tremendous learning experience and also a great way just to interact with some of the best entrepreneurs all over the country. So a lot of people listening are about my age, I'm 22. And so we're getting started. We have ambition for life and you casually mentioned investing $3 billion through KDT. What is it like working with that amount of money? It just seems surreal to me. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, when you, when you say it out loud, it sounds like a lot of money, right? Like, like we just did, but it's, it's just zeros, right? <laughs> I mean, it really is whether it's 3000 or 3 million or, you know, 3 billion. The reality is, is like, you're still, you still should do the same type of work, right? And there are great entrepreneurs and funds out there that are doing it with 10 million and a hundred million. We just had a bigger balance sheet, right? And so with that comes also a great responsibility, because you have the responsibility to create a tremendous impact and transformation. And so we took that seriously. It, um, they still take it very seriously at Coke, which I'm very grateful of. And I think Chase has done a great job kind of growing that team out at, out at KDT to continue doing that. But um, yeah, when, once you get there and you realize that you have a lot of capital to put to work, at first you're excited <laughs> And then you realize like there's a responsibility to get real returns. Mm -hmm. And when you have a lot of money to put to work, it's hard to make really good returns and to invest in the best companies. And because the best companies always have people fighting to get them in it. Right. So you have to be very strategic and thoughtful and relational to know those best entrepreneurs and get a foot, get, you know, get a seat at the table. Yeah, if you're trying to five or ten x your fund and you're working with billions, you just went from three billion. You're trying to go to fifteen or thirty billion. That's just an absorbent amount of money to have to find the right investments to get you those returns. That's right. And typically, you know, venture returns are um, they're they're going to be larger on scale than later stage returns, right? And so, if you got to put a hundred million dollar check you can't do that at the early stage, right? <laughs> so you're typically going to get as high a returns. And so you're fighting to figure out how do I put a lot of money to work, but get as high of returns and multiples as I can. And it's, um, it's a challenge. Um, and it's definitely was a challenge at times where the market just got crazy for a few years where people were just throwing money at everything with super high valuations. And so you can't have FOMO. You can't just follow the next big Silicon Valley name you really have to do your homework yourself. And um, I think that's where the, the biggest challenge lies for any firm, Coke, Coke not being any different. Right. So now you're, you're still on the investment side, but I would argue you've made a jump back to the entrepreneurship side. Why did you decide to go start your own firm and how's that experience been for you? Yeah. So I was at Coke for five, almost six years. And, you know, there is an entrepreneur bug in me. Yeah. And so when we saw Coke does a great job of investing and in, I would say the majority of their relationships are very strategic to Coke industries, right? So they're going to make investments in things that they can not only make money, but have like strategic operational value to them, which means they're not going to invest in everything. And the area where they don't do as much investing is typically more software oriented companies. And that's where my background was. And so I really wanted to focus on the software side of things. And so we broke out to create a high mount capital, uh, myself, another gentleman who left Coke and then my business partner, David Hawkins in uh, New York. And we started our own firm and, you know, we, um, we didn't start with $3 billion this time. <laughs> um, instead we we're, you know, raising a 150, $200 million fund, but we're really focusing on companies that are kind of, you know, late a stage to C stage. So think about companies that are doing 10 to 20 million in revenue that are trying to hit that inflection point and need, better financial chops to do that, need strategic relationships. They need somebody that's actually been down that road and had those scars. And that's us, right? Like we've built companies, we've, we've made investments. So how can we help that company grow from, let's say, you know, 10 million in revenue to a hundred million. That's the stage. And that's the kind of firm we're going that we're building. And so, um, what we always tell people we're building a firm. We're not just raising a fund. And, you know, the reason we made, we named it high Mount and, not with my last name or my partner's last name is we want it to outlive us, right? Like we want to bring on good young talent so that one day it's their firm. And so 
you know, hopefully this will be something that lasts for a couple hundred years. And, you know, that's step 912. We're on three right now. So we still got plenty of work to do, but it's an exciting time. And um, we're, we're very blessed to have the partners we do. What is, what is the importance to you in building a venture capital firm and the impact you hope it has? Yeah, so that's a good question. So first of all, I, I rarely say that we're a venture capital firm. Okay. And that's not anything against other venture firms. I just think there's a next stage company and firm we're trying to build. And so a lot of times we, we talk about just being a private investment firm, a very relational firm, because part of our DNA is to give first. And so when we talk to our investors and we talk to other companies, we don't typically lead with something of like, are you raising around? We typically sit down and say, what are you trying to do? How can we help you solve whatever problem you're doing? Sometimes that's with capital and we can make an investment. That's great. But sometimes it's just helping an entrepreneur or helping a company or helping a family solve a huge problem that they have. And through that, that creates this virtuous cycle that, then we get a chance to invest and then we get to know the company and then like it creates the flywheel that starts spinning. And so we just want to be the best private investors that are out there. And we also want to be known as like the hardest working and most generous too. that, Hey, these guys aren't afraid to call us in the night and help us figure something out that has nothing to do with their investment <laughs> um, because it's the right thing to do. Right. And that has impact on people's lives. And I can tell you like, even after working at Coke and, being on boards and talking to entrepreneurs. I think some of the most impactful conversations weren't the board meetings. They weren't these formal closes where we closed a hundred million dollars. It was like a Saturday afternoon call with the CEO, just checking in on him because he has a young kid or something. And they were so grateful. Like you, you really care because we forget sometimes that they're people. So this isn't a, just an investment dollar. These are real people. And when you invest in them, it's not surprising that a lot of times your investment actually goes well. And so we're constantly challenging ourselves to say, how are we investing in the people in the companies that we're in? And how do we invest in people that maybe we're not even invested in those companies, but we just care about them. We think they can have an impact. How do we invest in those as well? And so if high mountain can be known as those things, then I think we've created success. Yeah. That, that is the criticism that this industry often faces is that it's just ran by executives at the top of an ivory tower that are only concerned about how many zeros are on a piece of paper. And they've completely removed the human element and aspect of that relationship. Yeah. There's, there's a quote by George Washington that says, few men have the virtue to withstand the highest bidder. And, you know, this was coming from George Washington, who they wanted to make king at the time, right? They didn't want him just to lead the country. They wanted to make him king like England had. Right. And he said, no, that's not how this country should get going, right? I'm happy to serve, but I don't want to be the sole one in control of this. And I think that that same mentality needs to be part of our investing world where we're just stewards. Like the families and the institutions that give us capital to invest, it's not our capital, it's theirs. And so we should have a mindset that this is yours, that we're stewarding well for you. And I hope to give it back at five or 10 times. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to work hard to do that, but we're going to have real conversations. That means there's going to be ups and there's going to be downs and you should be prepared for me to tell you both. And if you can, if we can have that kind of transparency and hard conversations, then I think we all succeed and there'll be years that are much more difficult than others. I mean, once you've, you've lived through enough cycles, you realize it's not all rainbows and butterflies. Building great companies is exceptionally hard Finding great people is exceptionally hard. You have to create alignment of incentives. You have to create mutual benefit. Um, you have to work uh, for longer periods than people typically believe. We always tell people companies take twice as much capital and take twice as long as you think. Um, and so if you bake all those things in, it doesn't guarantee success, but it puts you in a good position to have success. Yeah. I've always heard that the opportunities in the down market and that, uh, well, I think it's, Wealth is made in the down market and collected in the up market is the saying of how it goes. And I think that what's critical to that is identifying who do you want to bet on. And with you seeing so many different founders and entrepreneurs, I'm sure you start to recognize characteristics of what makes a good founder or a good entrepreneur. What would those be if you had to think of a couple? Yeah. Well, the down market thing and how we think about it, like what's your mental model or framework? Uh, I, I once asked Charles Koch, 
because he's built such a tremendous business. Like, how do you think about this? Or how did you build a hundred billion dollar private company? He just looked me in the eye and goes, for too long, Jason, we just painted our ass white and ran with the antelope. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's colorful. What do you mean? <laughs> um, and really what he meant is like, when everybody else pulled back, we pulled back. When everybody else poured in, we poured in. He goes, we weren't contrarian. We didn't think for ourselves. He goes, it took us a lot of years to start building our own framework on how to invest. And, you know, I was fortunate to kind of be in the back half of Charles's career there. So I got to see how he implemented that. And it was really remarkable that he didn't just follow the crowd, right? You know, when markets were down, that's when Charles was pouring in. When markets were going crazy, he was pulling back. And he was always thinking differently and trying to triangulate with as many data points as possible so he could make a good decision. And I think that's what you have to do in any business you have. I don't care if you run a donut shop or, you know, a venture capital firm. Figure out what everybody else is doing, not so that you can do it too, but to say, how do we do something better? And sometimes that means not doing anything when everybody's being crazy. Um, and sometimes that means you have to be the one shouting from the rooftop when everybody else is saying, hey, we shouldn't do anything. Um, and I think if you, timing's everything, right? And especially in investing and building companies, timing is just, it's a huge part of that. And Steve Case once said that to me, he's like, you know, it's like surfing. You know, if you, you know, building your company is like building a surfboard. And if you get, you know, too far behind the wave, you don't get on it. If you get too far in front of the wave, you get crushed by it. So you got to build it and get right on the board at the same time. And that's, it's hard to do. Steve Case is a, is a name you just brought up. Uh, I think it'd be beneficial for you to explain who he is. Yeah. So Steve, sorry. No, you're, you're I, good. I'm an old, go, old guys, forget this. So Steve Case was the, the founder of AOL. Mm -hmm. He was actually one of the gentlemen that actually lived here in Wichita for a while too. He worked for Pizza Hut at the time <laughs> and he had the craziest, and I'm, I'm going to get this wrong, but his story was he worked for Pizza Hut and he was like head of pizza innovation or something. <laughs> and, I like, and I told him, I'm like, please tell me you have that shirt. Because I'm like, that's a classic shirt if yeah. it says pizza innovation on it. Um, but he, he started AOL, right? I mean, he was the guy that got us all on the internet. And, you know, way back in the day, getting on the internet and, you know, being able to surf it, there, there was no easy way to do that. I mean, Mark Andreessen and Mosaic and stuff allowed a web browser to be there, but somebody had to connect us to it. And AOL was kind of a big piece of that. And so Steve now runs a fund that invests in companies all throughout the U.S. and it's called Rise of the Rest. And so he doesn't believe great innovation happens at just the coasts. And I agree with him. I think it happens anywhere, everywhere and anywhere. Um, and so the question is then how do we invest in those people that may grow in Wichita or Columbus or Abilene or any of these smaller areas that maybe aren't known for great Silicon Valley companies? But that doesn't mean the next one can't come out of there. Yeah, that w one of the things that he talks about and that I often ponder is like, how do you build a community? Like everyone says, we need to invest more in the Midwest and that it's easier to raise money on the coast. And if you want to be successful, go to the coast f to start a business. And it's like, how do you change that mentality and actually put the framework and people in place to make that statement not true? Yeah, um, that's a multifaceted problem. And it's one that I've... I'm um, taking a look at and studied and still don't have all the answers to, <laughs> you know, 30 years into doing this. But what I'll say is if you look at the great um, tech ecosystems and Silicon Valley is kind of number one, but if you look at the other ones that have grown up, so Boulder, like what's happening in Boulder, Colorado, or Austin, Texas, or even New York, um, in Miami's done some in the last year, but there's a number of things that are part of that. And one of them is like, you need two or three big champions that are willing to go out there and put their name and resources and money on the line. So, you know, in, in Boulder, Colorado, that's Brad Feld, right? He moved out there, landed in downtown Boulder and said, I'm going to stay here. And he invested his own capital. He brought in other investors. He was also attached to a university, right? So there was young talent that could be brought into mm -hmm. it. So there's a big voice, right? It's like Brad, there is access to resources and people like a university, um, there were other people willing to take risks, so other investors. And so you need these elements in there. And so for Wichita, as an example, to be successful, well, it has Wichita State, so it's a, a good running start. Um, it needs two or three big names that are willing to, like, put their neck on the line mm -hmm. and, and shout from the rooftops, that, like, hey, we're going to do it here. So that hasn't really happened in Wichita yet. 
I think there are some people here that can, but they have to be willing to do that. Um, and then you have to have some people that have been successful in other businesses saying, Hey, I was good in oil and gas or real estate or minerals or whatever. I want to put a couple million bucks into this too, because it's important. I may not even fully understand it yet, but I'm going to put some money to work so that we can invest in the community. And that begins that flywheel effect. And, you know, another place that's growing up a lot is an, as another good example for people is if you go to Bentonville, so home, yeah. of, home of Walmart, yep. most people think it's just the home of Walmart. It is not anymore. It was. Now, if you look at what the Walton family's done there, you can live, play, eat, work. There's tech companies. There's cool things happening. It's completely changed in the last decade. And I give all the credit to the Waltons, primarily Stu and Tom over there that have said, hey, this is our home. We want this place to rock. I want you to be able to come here, bike to work, work in a cool tech company, you know, have great arts, have a cool airport, go to school. Like they're like, we want all this here. And so they've poured you know, hundreds of millions of their own dollars back into their community and it's transforming it. And but listen, I'm, I'm there in a week or so to, to spend time with some people that are be there. And I'm like, this place is awesome. And it was just because People doubled down and dedicated, did the hard thing, mm -hmm. and spent a decade plus of their lives pouring into it. It's super cool. My, my good friend, Quinn Robertson, is actually from Benville, Arkansas, and he just moved back there, and he's working for the Walton Family Foundation. Yeah. And so he's been sharing some of the stuff that they're working on. It's just incredible, the impact they're having. Yeah, and Quinn's one of those that's pouring into the ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. Like, he's helping out. He's not only doing it there, but he's also sharing it on social, and he's pouring into the ecosystem to say, hey... You don't have to just go to Dallas or Chicago. You can come here. And by the way, the quality of life in Bentonville, in terms of like, if you like to be outdoors and, and have a family, it's, it's tremendous. And so that's what, that's a great model that um, is similar to Nashville, similar to Austin, similar to Boulder. I, mean, I think Wichita can do it too. And, I, and there's a hundred other places that probably some that I don't even know of that are doing it well today, but there's a lot more that can learn from it. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it's important to get that visibility for those areas that need it. But easy, easy come, easy go is something I often think. I think the Midwest had a trait associated with it. It would be like resiliency, that grit. And I think that that goes for entrepreneurs, that goes for athletes. Like there's something about being from the Midwest that you have a little bit of an edge, or at least I feel like I do, and maybe I'm biased. But you have that desire to work hard because that's the way things have always been. And you don't expect anything to come easy here. Yeah. Well, so you're from St. Louis. Mm -hmm. There's a company in St. Louis called Worldwide Technologies. It's a multi, multi-billion dollar technology company that grew up in St. Louis. People don't even hardly know about it, but it's a huge <laughs> firm, right? It's a, it's, a con it's, a it's a massive conglomerate that was born in the Midwest by a gentleman by the name of Dave Stewart that most people don't know about. You know why? Because he just put his nose to the grindstone <laughs> and just built something, right? And, and so you don't need all the celebrity and all the notoriety. Sometimes it's just blood, sweat, and tears and getting, getting to work. And it's funny, people always look at these things and like, it's an overnight success. They, they miss the 10, 15 years that you put into it. They just saw it become a success. And I think uh, a lot of Midwest entrepreneurs, that's kind of their DNA. It's like, they're not trying to, you know, be the biggest celebrity or have their name in lights. They just want to build a great business that serves people. And if you do it long enough, who knows, it, it could become a multi-billion dollar company. I love that. Jason, as we start to wrap up, I have two questions for you. The first one being, where can people find you online if they want to connect or learn more? Yeah, so probably the two best places is you can always find me on Twitter at just at Jason Illion. Um, you can also find me on LinkedIn at Jason Illion. Um, and you go to highmountcap.com. That's our, that's our firm's website. So we take incoming on all of those because we just try to help entrepreneur and people where they are. Awesome. And then my final question for you is looking back at this really cool journey that you've been on, what advice would you offer to your 22 year old self? Um, probably a couple of things. First and foremost, I would remind him that, um, it's not about you. Like I think when you get started as an athlete or an entrepreneur or whatever, you start to think, Hey, it's a, this is about me. Look at how great I'm doing in the company I'm building. It's not about you at all. In fact, it's about your people. And the more that you can, the great leaders are the ones that um, take the blame and push all the credit to their people. And I think I've done that well at times and I've also failed at that at times. And, but 
if I could tell my 22 year old self that I'd say, Hey, remember, it's not about you, man. Um, it's about all the people and you'll, you'll, your firm, your company, your family will accelerate faster. Um, two, I would tell my 22 year old self, um, that it's not just about business too. Like you're also going to be raising a family and you have other real relationships that matter just as much. And as, as men, we get really caught up in building our companies. And I often challenge other guys to say, do you spend that much time planning out the week for your family as you do in your company? And the answer is almost none of us do, but how important are your kids and your wife? And like my, I have three kids. Those are like three, I mean, they're three legends, <laughs> right? They're, they're three change makers. They're mm. three transformers. There is no better way to duplicate myself than to pour into their lives. And there is no better way to change the world around me than to transform and love my wife well. And I think that sometimes we get so caught up in that, hey, the only way that me as a man or me as a person can change is to build this company. And I'm like, that's not the only way. That is part of it. That is part of your call. But the other part of your call, if you're going to be married, is like the pour into your wife, the pour into your kids, the pour into your community. And if you do that, just watch the change that happens around you. And I see that with my kids now is like they're, you know, they're 15, 13, and 11. So they're all growing up to be young men and women. And they're becoming real strong men and women now, men of character, women of virtue. And um, I, I don't ever want to downplay that because I think, I hope that when people look back, they see, well, yeah, High Mount was cool and Coke was cool and those companies were cool. But did you see that family? Did you see what they became? Did you see the lives that they touched? If we can be known for that even more than the business side, um, I will be an exceptionally blessed man. That's really cool. Thank you for coming on, Jason. Yeah, thanks for having me.